Hello folks, this is week two of CIS 2353, Data Structures with Java. This week we're going to cover chapter three in the Collins book, which is on algorithm analysis. So let's get going. This week I uh, chose to work on some slides, even though I did upload some summer, uh, summary notes. The slides have a little bit more content. I would also recommend reading the book as well. Um, so before we start, um, there's a f story that I want you to uh, hear. It's pretty popular. Um, you may have heard it in your um, elementary or middle uh, school, possibly high school, or you've maybe maybe you've never heard it before. But um, in this story, there was a famous mathematician that many of you have probably heard his name. It's Archimedes. And he was asked by a king to determine if this golden crown um, that had been commissioned by the king was made of pure gold and not part silver, as one of the informants had claimed. So they were trying to basically find out, did the goldsmith lie and say this is pure gold when, in fact, um, it actually had silver in it? So Archimedes discovered a way to perform this analysis while taking a uh, well he was taking a bath. He noticed that water spilled out of the bath in proportion to the amount of him that went into it. Realizing the implications of this fact, he immediately got out of the bath and ran through the city naked, shouting, Eureka! Eureka! I found it! For he'd discover an analysis tool, which we'll be interested in in just a little bit, a different analysis tool. But the one he discovered was displacement. So he discovered that when he entered the bathtub, water came out. Um, in proportion of what uh, amount of him went in. So, when you combine this with a simple scale for, to determine the weight, they could determine if the king's new crown was in fact made of gold, uh, as the goldsmith had claimed, or if it had silver in it as well. So, Archimedes dipped the crown, and an equal weight amount of gold, that was known to be pure gold, into a bowl of water to see if they both displaced the same amount. If they did, then that means that the crown was in fact being the same weight and having the same displacement, it would mean they were made of the same material. However, this wasn't so good for the goldsmith because it was determined that the crown displaced uh, more water uh, than an equal weight lump of pure gold, indicating the crown was not in fact pure gold. So, for our purposes, um, we're going to look at data structures and algorithm analysis, specifically in this chapter. Um, data structures are systematic um, structures in which um, data is organized and accessed. The algorithms are the specific step-by-step -step procedures for performing, uh, performing tasks. So, in this um, course, we're going to be interested in an uh, analysis tool to determine the goodness or the uh, appropriateness of algorithms. So that's what we're mostly concerned with right now. So if we want to estimate the efficiency of a method, so we can evaluate a method or compare two methods, this analysis will be dependent or independent of the uh, computer used. Now there are two things we're going to be concerned with in this chapter. In this chapter they actually cover the more general case and the more often used case for um, um, analysis of the problem prior to implementation, that is uh, big O notation, which is used to estimate the time and space requirements of methods before they're implemented, so it can potentially save a lot of time. However, there's another technique which is analyzing the actual runtime of these methods once they're implemented on a specific system. But prior to that, we want to look and see, is there a way we can analyze um, a problem and then determine different algorithms, possibly, and then compare them before they're even implemented um, in actual methods? So the analysis will be independent of the computer used. It's independent of the platform or the language, such as and the language restrictions also, such as Java's maximum int value of approximately 2 billion. So we say analysis of algorithms rather than analysis of methods. So we're looking for a general way to determine, you know, hey, how can we uh, determine the efficiency of methods? So 
we learned last week that the correctness of a method depends on whether the method does what it's supposed to do, but the efficiency of a method depends on how the method is defined. So you could have a really, really great method, greatly defined method that's uh, perfect and does what it's supposed to do, but if it takes a year to run and you need the data in, you know, a couple minutes, it's not going to do you much good. So that would be a correct method, but a very inefficient one. So is there a way to make it better? We might ask questions like that. So execution time requirements is approximately equal to the number of statements executed in a trace of the method given as a function of n the problem size. So what do we mean by the problem size? For example, you might read in an integer and generate that many prime numbers. Then n would represent the integer read in. You will either be given n explicitly or n uh, is typically clear from the context. So let's define another term. Given a problem of size n, again it could be an input, it could be a size of an array, could be the number of times a loop is executed and iterated. Um, given the problems of size n, a method's worst time of n is the maximum number of statements executed in a trace of that method. So let's look at a specific example. Assume we have an array that's labeled uh, with indices 0 through n minus 1, as most arrays are, of type integer. So we have a loop here, then we have an if statement, and then we have a print line. So we might ask, well, what's the worst time of n? So this is a little specific. If we look back here, we see that there's an initialization of i, which is just one statement. It's independent of n. It does not matter if n is 100 or a million or 2. i is going to take up one statement. So we can consider that a single statement. That's why they're counting it as 1 right there. Well, how many times um, does the loop iterate? Well, it goes from 0 up to um, n minus 1 does this comparison n times. i plus plus is uh, executed n minus 1 times because by the time you get to the uh, n minus 1 time it's going to determine this is false and break out of the loop before it'll increment the nth time. And then it performs this comparison n minus 1 times so the i plus plus and the comparison here are both essentially how many times the loop is actually executed the body of the loop. So those are all n minus 1. Same thing with the system dot out print line right here. The maximum possibility here is, if this is always true, is that um, it happens n minus 1 times. So in total the worst possible time, um, independent of a particular operating system, etc., um, is 4n minus 2, right? 1, 2, 3, 4, uh, minus 1, minus 2, minus 3, and then plus 1, so that's minus 2, 4n minus 2. That's the number of executions, um, or the exe what we call the execution time, the number of statements that have to be executed. Similarly, you could calculate the average time. They go over how to do that in the book. Um, they, they come to this conclusion right here. Um, I will direct you to page... Um, 106 in the book, they kind of do a decent explanation of it. But worst case is usually um, what we're more concerned with. So maximum and average are over all possible traces of the method for all possible field, parameter, and input values. However, we want to quickly obtain an upper bound estimate of the worst time and average time to get an idea of how bad the time can be. Because um, in general, maybe a function works uh, pretty quickly, but maybe in its worst time it's really, really bad, so it might take really, really long, and maybe that's um, not acceptable. So finding out the worst case uh, scenario, you might think, well, wouldn't, be, wouldn't the best case be what we'd really want to know, and that's not the case. Um, the best case is just icing on the cake. An even average case, average case is usually more interesting, um, but best case isn't really that important. I mean, it's great if a function will uh, trace or will execute very quickly. However, that is not what we're mostly interested in. We're interested in what is the worst possible um, performance of this particular algorithm or the worst possible amount of space, largest possible amount of space this will take up. So we use an analysis tool, a technique, 
in computer science called Big O notation. The definition of the Big O notation is, um, this is the mathematical definition, let G be a function that has non-negative integer arguments, okay, so that means it's non-negative, so that means it could be 0, 1, 2, 3, etc., and returns a non-negative value for all arguments. Okay, so there, uh, there's this G function, just think of it as a function that takes non-negative arguments and returns a non-negative value. That's all we need right now. We define big O of G, um, also called the order of G, to be the set of functions. Now notice it's a set, okay, not an individual function. O of G looks like functional syntax, but it actually represents a set, which is more than one item. You can think of it as kind of an array of possibilities. To be the set of functions f, this is another function, different function, such that for some positive constant c and some negative or non-negative constant k, this function, any given function, um, are less than or equal to c times, remember our g function here, g of n, for all n greater than or equal to k. Now you might look at that and your brain might want to explode, um, especially if you haven't taken a higher order mathematics. Um, this, isn't, this is pretty much pre-calculus level later algebra type stuff. It's not really that difficult, but sometimes in the grand scheme of things it's a little bit difficult to understand. So we, we'll do some examples and it'll make a little bit more sense. So we say that f is O of G. Most of the time you will see the syntax f equals O of G and you have to be very very careful because that does not mean f and O of G are equivalent. We say that f, a particular function, belongs to a set O of G. Okay. If f is O of G then f is eventually bounded above by G. Remember these are functions that means we could graph them. So that means one function could eventually um, get larger than another function and then never get smaller. Again, it'll always be larger, so that means it'll eventually, um, f is eventually bounded above by g. So if f is this thing right here and it goes back and forth, uh, maybe g starts out lower, but eventually it gets larger than this one and it starts growing uh, larger or um, we, we say that f is um, eventually bounded above by g. It doesn't mean always, for all input. But at some point, the input size n will be large enough, sufficiently large enough, such that this um, big O of g, the f will be bounded by uh, g, or some constant times g at some point. So we can think of O of G as the set of functions, again, set of functions, not an individual functions, that are bounded above by G. So here's some notation. Suppose G is such that G equals N squared for N equals 0, 1, 2, etc. We would write O of N squared, big O of N squared, rather than writing big O of G. Okay, so we'd say that is one set. Okay, that is one big O set. So let's look at an example. Show that for the following method that we'll see in a second, worst time of n is big O of n, where n is the length of the array. So here's our function. This is actual code. Um, sometimes you'll just look at an algorithm and determine uh, what's going to happen, but in this case this is actual code in Java. You see this named sequential search. We set the length, then you have a for loop, single for loop, and then inside of that you have this if statement. If it ever finds the key, return true, and then if it breaks out, return false. So the worst case is for a sequential search is uh, the thing you're looking for is not in the array. That's the worst possible case for a search, right? It's not there, so that means it has to go through every possible um, element. So they go here and they say worst case frequency for the initialization of the variable a, key, length, and i that we saw here. So you've got um, a, which is a parameter that still takes some memory, key, length and i, that's four constant, they're independent of n, um, or the length in general, this is our n this time. Um, if the length's a million or a thousand, it doesn't really matter, it's still going to take, have to initialize this, 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 and this, it's constant, it has nothing to do with the length. Um, i minus length, that'll go m plus one times, i plus plus happens n times, 
the comparison, the if statement is n times, and then a return statement is also single, so because that'll only happen once, it's constant. So ultimately you have 3n plus 6. So now we have to show um, that each term in the 3n plus 6 is less than or equal to some constant times n. Remember that big old fancy uh, definition we'll find in just a second. We want to look um, we want to see that f is bounded on top by g, so we have to see f of n less than or equal to c g of n for all n greater than or equal to k. So this is a constant, and that is a constant. Remember in mathematics, when you have a constant in front of something else, a variable or another function, that is called a coefficient. So it is a constant being multiplied by this function here. So what you're saying is that um, maybe f of n is itself, n squared plus 3. Well, we can't say that it's bounded by g of n because the n squared plus 3 will actually be larger um, or the same at, many, at some point. But if you multiply a constant by this, you can increase it and make it uh, larger so it will be bounded on top by this. And then this will grow, large, grow faster. Okay, so we know that 3 of n is less than or equal to 3 of n. That's kind of, you know, straightforward. Now what about the 6 part of this um, worst time that we found? Well, we know um, right away that 6 is going to be less than or equal to 6n for all n greater than or equal to 1. If n is 1, um, then 6 is less than or equal to 6. That checks out. 2, then the 6n will be 12. So 6 is less than or equal to 12, etc. So we know that that is always the case. If you take the 3n and then add it to a 6n right here, you get 9n. So if you add those sides, you get that 3n plus 6, which was our worst case, is always going to be less than 9n for all n greater than or equal to 1. Now this is one possibility. You could have very well, you could also say that 3n plus 6 is less than or equal to 10n or 12n or 15n um, for all n greater than or equal to 1 or 2 or 3 or 4. Um, but this is just one way to do it. You just have to pr you have to show one instance, one instance where you can find a c, a constant that is multiplied by our function here, g. This is n, so 9n, and then you have to find a k, uh, the point at which we know that 9n is going to be greater than um, or equal to the 3n plus 6. So if it's 1, then you have 3 plus 6, that's 9. 9 less than or equal to 9 times 1, which is 9, so that's true. If it's 2, this will be 18 on this side. This will be 6 plus 6, that's 12. So it will be bounded on top by this. So this right here is what we're concerned with. So our big O is actually big O of n. Okay, we don't, we don't consider the constant constants when we actually write the big O out. We just say it's big O of n because we found a particular constant that you can multiply by it and another constant, which is the... Um, point at which this function will become and remain larger than this function. In other words, c is 9, k is 1, worst time of n is less than c of n for all n greater than or equal to k, so that is the worst time of n is big O of n. We would say that is a, um, that has linear time. Um, we would also say that the above worst, worst time is also O of n squared, O of n5, O of n cubed, um, because it is it is also bounded by these, but these are less precise. Typically, when we're talking about big O, we're talking about um, the we want the worst case scenario for that particular algorithm. We can make it worse, but um, there's no need to make it worse. It does still belong to these categories, though. Um, this is a set of upper bounds, they will follow a sequence of orders. You have O of 1, which is called constant time. You have O of log n, which is logarithmic time. O of n, which is linear time. O of n log n, which is linear logarithmic time. And then less efficient, you have, or less uh, quick, given the same input size n, in other words, takes more instruction, is quadratic time, O of n squared. These are growth rates. So n squared, you'll see, grows the fastest. Then you have n log n, n log of n, and then constant 
does not depend on n, so it stays straight. So if you can try to find an algorithm that stays under um, the smaller ones here, then you've made a more efficient algorithm. In the following examples, we can determine an upper bound in big O notation of worst time. Here's an example. 4 at j equals 0, j less than 10,000, j plus plus. So let's say we have this inside of a method, and you have a value n come in. Do we see an n here, or a length, or anything besides this constant 10,000? No, it doesn't matter going into whatever this function is. This function may arbitrarily have more stuff in it. Um, but if we're looking at this code segment, it will not matter what n is. This will always execute 10,000 times doesn't matter. So that means this is big O of 1, it's constant. Because the number of loop iterations is independent of any n. Here's another one. int j equals 0, j less than n, j plus plus. So the, the question is how many times, ultimately, what's the worst part of this? It's not the initialization, it's not even the comparisons really. We could, we could look. Um, the comparison might be an okay thing, but the initialization is um, very insignificant compared to the amount of statements that the comparisons and things will have to do. Remember, because when you go through a for loop, this first part is only executed at the beginning. It skips it on, previous, on um, subsequent uh, executions. We will do the comparison and the increment, which both happen around n times. Same thing with printing out the statement. That happens n times. So this loop um, happens about n times. Okay, so if n is 5, this loop will print it out 5 times. Um, if n is 20, it will print it out 20 times. So it is directly, the number of statements executed is directly proportional to n. So that means it's linear. It's a big O of n. So you could arrive at the big O of n estimate without counting the number of statements executed because O of 3n plus 2 equals O of 7n minus 4 equals O of 12n plus 83. These are just numbers we're throwing out here. Um, remember that big O, you do not actually, it, it's weird, it's not right actually to put the statements, because this is not a parameter really. This just says we're in the class of um, things that have n in here, because this would be our um, coefficient here. And since we have an n and then a constant term, which one grows larger faster? That's the big question. Which one grows larger faster? Does the constant have much to do with it? No. Anything attached to the n will grow way faster than the constant. Uh, one analogy I'd seen in a couple books is the elephant and the goldfish. If you have to feed an elephant versus feed a goldfish, which one are you going to be more concerned about in your budget? The elephant eats a whole lot more. So the elephant, the goldfish is insignificant compared to what the elephant's going to eat. So that's the same thing with big O notation. N, whatever's attached to N, this part grows drastically faster than the constant. The constant doesn't actually grow, period. But we'll have the same situation where you have an N squared term. If you have N squared and then maybe 4N or 5N or whatever, 3N, doesn't matter, the N squared term is going to grow drastically faster than the linear term. Um, so it will um, be more important, quote-unquote, to the overall analysis of the algorithm. So all we need is the count. Uh, to count is the number of iterations as a function of n. We just know that it belongs to n. So we would just say that this loop here is big O of n. Okay, big O of n. We don't worry about, you know, big O of n plus this plus that, 3n, whatever. Um, what about this example? So this example is kind of quirky here. Um, j equals 8, n minus 3, j plus plus. Well, this is really complicated, but you'll notice that we have some constant here and some n there. At some value of n, this is going to start growing, and it's going to go around n times, approximately. So the number of statements executed is, who cares? You don't have to calculate that part. Okay, You just need to know what... Um, is the part of the algorithm, in this case a for loop, that uh, takes the most processing, okay, or causes the most uh, executions to occur. So in this case, this constant 
um, right here into j equals a, that, that only takes constant time because it's a single statement that's only done once. It doesn't really matter what you're initializing it to. This right here, this comparison is going to go n minus 3 times, and we know in the big, the big uh, scheme of things, it doesn't matter if it's n minus 3 or n minus 50, eventually n is going to be large enough such that the n is going to dominate the whole execution, right? So this loop's going to execute n times, some constant times n. So we say that it is big O of n. Here's another example, sequential search. Um, I think we looked at this earlier. You've got i less than the length of a particular array. Um, we don't really care about the specifics. We just know that there's a length. So if the length, length we can call n in the uh, big scheme of things, grand scheme of things, so it's big O of length, but it's big O of n because it happens linearly. If the length is 5 or 10 or 20 or 100 million, um, it's going to happen. Uh, linearly. Matrix addition. Now this might be a little bit more complicated, so take a second to look at this one, pause the video, and then come back when you think you have the answer. Okay, so now that you've had a chance to look at this, um, look at the things that seem to take up less time. So these are just initializations, so you can think of these as constant. They're independent of the size of the arrays or of some value n that we produce here of the length of a doesn't really matter. We create an array here. Um, then you'll notice that we have a loop and then another loop inside of that loop and then some initialization here. So this is matrix addition. If you've had any kind of linear algebra or some um, course like that, you'll be familiar with this. So you take a 2D array and you basically take the two and then add the corresponding elements and then store their results in the corresponding element in a third array, which is C. So you have a loop here and a loop there. So what's dominating um, the time here, the execution time, regardless of what platform you're on, regardless of what machine you're on, what is dominating the time? You'll see that we know if it were a single loop, it would be n times, right? But then we've got this outer loop in which this inner loop is contained. So if the inner loop goes n times and the outer loop goes n times out, uh, outer, um, we know that for every time that the outer loop goes once, this inner loop goes n times. So for i equals 0, it'll go j equals 0, j equals 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, da, 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 all the way up to n. Then it'll go to i equals 1, and then 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 0, up to n, i equals 2, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So it's going to keep going like that. So it's n times n. We can multiply these terms. So we know that this is happening n squared times. Therefore, the order is n squared, big O of n squared. Okay, number of inner loop iterations. So that's n squared. Another example here. This one's a little bit more interesting. Um, while n is greater than 1, uh, eventually you have a large enough n here, but you have n equals n divided by 2 every iteration of the loop. So this one might be a little bit different, so be very careful. I want you to pause the video and look at it and see if you can figure, is it constant? Is it linear? Is it logarithmic? Is it quadratic? What is it? Okay, now that you've had a chance to look at it, you've got um, it being divided by 2 or split in half each time. So if n is 100, is this going to iterate 100 times? No, it's not. Um, it's going to divide it by 2 each time. So this is going to iterate very few times compared to the size of n. So let's look at a simple case. If n is a power of 2, for example 32, you can keep dividing it by 2, because remember our logarithms we're going to deal with are base 2. So let's divide by 2, 2, 2, 2, 2, until you get to 1 or less than 1. This one's easy because it's a power of 2, but even if it weren't, you could keep dividing by 2 until you got to um, equal to 1 or less than 1. Okay, less than or equal to 1. So how many times did we divide it? Once, twice, three, four, five. So when n is 32, this is our problem size. Remember, we're always considered, uh, concerned about our problem size. The number of times to divide n by 2 in order to get to 1 is 5. So that's the number of iterations of, for example, that while loop if n is 32. So another way to say this, since it took us five times, 
we can say that log base 2 of 32 is 5. So if n is a power of 2, the number of times to divide n by 2 until n equals 1 is log base 2 of n. If n is not necessarily a power of 2, some division, such as 17 divided by 2, will reduce n by slightly more than half, so the number of halvings might be slightly fewer um, than log 2 of n, but it'll stay proportional to log 2 of n. But specifically, for any positive integer, n, the number of divisions by 2 to get from n to 1 is the floor of, n lo or of log n. So remember, floor of some value returns the largest integer that's less than or equal to x. So if this were um, 5.7, the floor would return 5, because it says largest integer that's less than the value you pass in, which is a real number. If it's 2.2, largest integer less than 2.2 is 2. If it's 3.9, the largest integer less than 3.9 is 3. Okay, so back to this whole situation, when we had the while loop up here, you're dividing by 2 each time. So we would say that this has um, log of n, uh, log 2 of n, but usually the 2 is left out when we write it. We would say that that is log of n, because it divides each time. This is the splitting rule. The number of halvings to get from n to 1 is floor of log base 2 of n. Splitting rule is the basis for most estimates that are log 2 of n. By the base conversion formula in Appendix 2, um, you have log, of n, log 2 of n equals log uh, natural log of n, log 3 of n. Remember, because this is big O. Big O is just saying that they are all logarithmic, and it doesn't matter. They're all part of the same set, essentially. So you can ignore the base and just write O of log n. Here's another example. You have, while n greater than 1, n equals n divided by 3. So you would say the worst, uh, worst time is floor log base 3 of n. But remember, that doesn't really matter that it has a base 3. It could be a base 3, a base 47, a base uh, 2, base 17. doesn't really matter. It's still log of n. Okay, That's our category. Determine the big O estimate of the worst time of the following fragment. Okay, So n greater than 5, print it out, n equals n divided by 12. So take a few minutes, pause the video, see if you can figure it out. All right, so we know we're dividing by 12 each time, but it doesn't matter if we're dividing it in half, dividing it in thirds, dividing it in fifths. Ultimately, you're going to have um, log of n. Here's another very famous algorithm, the binary search algorithm. This uh, binary search algorithm, you notice you have a lot of constant initializations, int um, array, because it's passed in as a parameter, and then you have the key passed in. Um, low is equal to 0, high is equal to length minus 1. This is independent of the size of the problem. Binary search, which you should be somewhat familiar with, you'll become more familiar with as we go on with different uh, different uh, topics in the book. We'll talk more about searching and sorting, but you might be vaguely familiar with this binary search. It's divide, it divides your um, search area in half each time it iterates until it finds its match. So it's much more efficient than uh, linear search in terms of its um, big O. So, but what is the big O? So you find the midpoint at the very beginning of this loop equals low plus high divided by 2. So your problem space has to do with the overall search area. So the search area, actually, if you look at how the search is being done, um, the midpoint is there, and then you get the mid value at that particular point in the array. So if the array has 100 items, um, you select a midpoint um, at 50, if the key you're looking for, we're assuming the array is sorted, by the way, or binary search doesn't work, if the value you're looking for um, is, or if the, uh, the mid value is less than the value you're looking for, then you set the low to the midpoint 1, and if its mid value is greater than the key, you set the high equal to mid minus 1, otherwise you found the, the, you found the item if it's not less than or greater than the key, so that means you actually found it, so you return true, hey, I found it. Um, or you could 
you know, do variations on this where you return the actual index or what have you. But the idea is that this search area is divided by two every time. So that is log in because it's the splitting rule. The splitting rule still applies. Even though it's not quite as obvious, we're not doing an explicit n passed in, we do have the low and the high, um, and we're doing a loop version of this. You can also write this recursively if you want to try to do that. Another example here, you have a for loop here that goes n times, and then the while loop is not inside the for loop, right? So it, it's separate. That one is um, decreasing and dividing in half each time. So this one's a log n, this is an n. So you have to think which one's larger, is n or log n? Because ultimately we could say, oh, this is big O of n plus log of n. But just like the elephant goldfish example, the elephant's going to eat way more than the goldfish. So is n or log of n smaller? We know from our example with binary search versus sequential search, sequential search is big O of n. Binary search is big O of log n. So big O of log n um, is far fewer iterations than big O of n. So big O of n is way worse than big O of log n. So we would say ultimately that this worst case is big O of n. In other words, this part of the, alg of the overall algorithm, the part where it goes through n times, dominates the running time of this overall um, algorithm. In general, if worst case or worst time of n is O of g for one part of a method and O of h, meaning two different functions, just like we had here, right? You've got n here and um, log of n here. So there's our g and our h, n log of n. In general, if you do see this situation where you have O of G and then O of H for another part of the method, the worst time is O of G plus H for the entire method. So you would say that note that big O of N plus log of N, so these are the two different parts, which one dominates? Which one's the elephant? The N is the elephant. The N is larger than log of N. So we would say that it is just big O of N. Now this does not mean in actual practice that the log of N has no effect on the running time of the algorithm, but you're saying theoretically especially, but also it has practical implications, that the larger values of N, for very large values of N, the N part is going to dominate the running time versus the log of N. Another example, you have a loop here. Um, this is a loop that happens n times, but this time the while loop is inside, being divided by half. So what's going on here? Well, since temp is based on n and you're dividing that, um, this is kind of a log n situation, and then this is an n, but do we add them? We don't because they're not separate, because for each time this goes a log of n uh, number of times, this goes n times. So it's actually n times log of n. We call that linear logarithmic. So n log n. That is another class of big O. n log n is uh, larger um, than just n. Okay, It's smaller than n squared, but it's larger than just n. This is actually a very important um, big O set uh, category because um, a lot of sorting algorithms, the most efficient sorting algorithms, are um, n log n. So it's very important in computer science. Another example, you have the for loop going n times, while loop dividing in half each time. So you have another log n situation here and an n situation there. Um, another example here. <clears throat> this one's a little bit weird because you have i doubling each time and based on n. But we would say in both of these, in this situation, you have O of n to the power of 1 half, because this is doubling each time. Let g be a function. Okay, here's another definition here, because sometimes you want a lower bound. So what is the best case situation? Remember, we talked about that earlier. Big O is a lot more important, but we'll breeze over this just so you're aware of it. Big omega notation provides a lower bound. So that means what's the best case scenario? In this case, the definition is very similar to the big O, except uh, rather than being bounded above, you're bounding it below. It's the lower bound. So greater than or equal to. So the function you find is greater than or equal to C of G of N. All right. Worst time is O of N. 
um, we would also say that these are the um, big omega or the best times. Big theta provides a lower, or I'm sorry, yeah. Um, well, that's, yeah, that's uh, omega right there. Big theta provides a lower and an upper bound. So this is like an average time. So um, are there some where the big theta um, and the big O, or bi I'm sorry, big omega and big O are, um, if F is in both of these sets, then it is also in big theta. So that gets a little bit squirrelier. It's a little bit more complicated. Um, but sometimes that is useful as well. That gives us more of an um, average idea, an idea of what the average is. So, Okay, so if the worst time is big theta of 1, we say that the worst time is constant. If it's log n, we say it's logarithmic in n. If it's n, linear in n. n log n, linear logarithmic in n. We would say theta of n squared, it's quadratic in n. Okay. Um, we'll skip some of these. I'll let you do those on your own. Uh, exponential is also important. Um, if we have a situation where um, the, whether it's big O or big omega, big theta, what have you, if you have a constant x, for example, to the power of the problem size, that's very bad. It's very different than a polynomial. That means it's going to grow exponentially. Okay, so if you say, if you ever hear people casually use the term, this this is getting out of hand exponentially, or, you know, I'm going to debt exponentially, or this is exponentially pro causing me more problems, um, exponential does grow extremely fast. And that would be the worst case scenario for an algorithm, or a very, very bad case scenario. In general, we say that exponential time methods should be avoided if possible because their run times will be unacceptably long, unacceptably long for many common values of n. So for example, if the worst time is 2 to the n and the computer executes a billion statements per second, if n is equal to 100, now this is a relatively small size set here, um, if it if the computer has a billion statements per second and n is only a hundred, if the if the runtime is two to the n, the sun will collapse before the method has completed. Okay, that is not an exaggeration. It takes years and years and years, millennia. You will be long, long dead before this algorithm gets done. Um, uh, com uh, executing. So regardless of how awesome your hardware is. The hardware is not going to take care of the exponentially bad algorithm. So if there's a way around it, that's the best way to do it. Sometimes exponential time methods are unavoidable. An intractable problem is one for which any algorithm to solve the problem takes exponential time. Intractable is often used as a common uh, term to refer to, for example, a difficult situation or a difficult person. You're being intractable or you're intractable or this is really intractable. Um, it's commonly used that way, but it has a very, very specific definition that it's any algorithm that the only known... Um, the only no, or a specific problem, the only known algorithms that can solve the problem take exponential time. So it's very bad. We'll see examples of an, of an intractable, intractable problem in Chapter 5. Okay. Um, da, da, da. Here's some conventions. If the calling object is a collection of elements, n equals the number of elements in the collection. If no estimate of worst, uh, worst time of n is given, worst time of n is constant. If no estimate of average time is given, then the average time and the worst time are equal. Now here's another scenario. Remember I told you there are different ways of determining the efficiency of an algorithm. Remember, um, we talked before about the correctness of a method. Now we're talking about efficiency of methods. So correctness says, does the method do what it says it's supposed to do? And we could determine that, but the efficiency is also important. The two primary ways that we talk about estimating the, and determining the efficiency are the big O, which we just covered. That is used um, extensively um, before the algorithm is actually implemented because it can actually save a lot of time. If you look at it and say, wow, that is a really crappy, crappy algorithm. I don't think I'm going to waste the time implementing it. You might save yourself a ton of time. 
the other thing is once it's implemented, you can write out the big O for it, but you also might want to do a runtime analysis. Maybe you know that algorithm is always going to run um, in a particular environment. So you might get a numerous set of times, but it might give you an idea or give you some sort of valuable information as to the efficiency of the particular um, method in, in a real system. So to estimate the method's runtime, the uh, to do actual runtime analysis, okay, rather than uh, amortized or um, big O analysis, we can actually run it. That's why it's called runtime analysis rather than um, some other name. You have the system classes nanotime, gives you the nanoseconds elapse from some fixed time. Here's a skeleton of a timing program. You have a start time, finish time, elapsed time. You might set the start time at a particular nano time. Later, you get the finish time after you have the task in between the two. And then you calculate the elapsed time. That tells you how much time did it take, approximately, to execute your algorithm. In multiprogramming environments, such as Windows, elapsed time is a very crude estimate of run times. To see the current processes in Windows, type Control alt delete because that will, the other processes will affect how your um, algorithm runs as well, right? Because it has to share with other processes. What about randomness? Given a collection of numbers, a number is selected randomly if each number has an equal chance of being selected. A number so selected is called a random number. The method nextInt in the random class returns a random, quote-unquote, int in the range from 0 to n minus 1 inclusive. Now the reason we put random in, in quotes is that um, the value return is not really technically random. If you look at the method definition, you can calculate a return value. So the value return is called a pseudo-random number. It actually uses the system time. If it's seeded, um, this is the best way to do it, is just don't give it a parameter. If you initialize the seed number, which is used in a function uh, inside of the inner workings of this random uh, class, when you create this and you call nextInt, this depends on the seed, it's a log variable. If you initialize it to 100 and start printing out nextInt over and over and over again, eventually you're going to see a repeated pattern. That's why it's not considered random. However, if you use system nano time, this um, nano time is the number of nanoseconds since a certain uh, particular time. That is random enough, okay? So that's the best way to do it in most cases. The current value of seeds determines the next value of the seed, and this is used in calculating the value returned by next int. So if I have random r equals new random seeded with 100, um, you'll notice um, that we print this out with a random next int 4. Each time, so that gives you from uh, 0, uh, it could be 0, 1, 2, or 3 are the possible outputs because it's non-inclusive upper bound. Each time the segment is run in any computing environment, the output will be the same, okay? Remember, because the seed will cause it to be the exactly the same regardless of whether I run it in Java on a Mac over in California, or if I run it on a uh, Windows 7 machine or Windows 8 machine, it will always return this sequence for the first set of numbers. So that could be very, very bad. You, but in some cases, you want predictable but random-ish. Um, <laughs> that has to, a lot to do with some um, uh, predictable input uh, rather than completely random systems, but sometimes you want um, actual, uh, actually random stuff, okay? But it is actually useful to have the same sequence every time. You can compare different methods with the same sequence of random values. So for example, we were talking about what kind of input can we provide before we do our runtime analysis. Well, if you can predict and know that it's going to be the same set of integers, um, gotten uh, received from nextint, then that's a good thing if you want to be able to do um, compare two different methods on this um, set of numbers, right? Because we know that they're going to have the same set of numbers, but we don't want to sit there and come up with the values ourselves. Um, so it's good. Repeatability is a hallmark of the scientific method. We're able to repeat it very simply by using the same seed. 
So, write the code to print out how long it takes to generate the pseudo random uh, integer 11111 if the initial seed is 100, and the range of pseudo random integers is 0 to 20,000. So, recall the timer skeleton. I'll let you uh, work on that yourself. I don't know if they put a, an answer in the book. Um, if you're interested, I can uh, come up with one for you. Um, but this would be an interesting uh, little exercise. They've got a lot of really good exercise in the book, so I highly recommend you actually get it if you haven't already. It's a very good book. Um, so, if you have any questions, uh, please feel free to email me, jpbaugh at oaklandcc.edu. Thank you very much, and have a great day. Bye.